So today, we are celebrating Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday, and we'll get to what that is in a moment, but on the church calendar, that's the tradition that we celebrate today. Uh, At our church, especially around this time of year right now, we have a lot of you who are training, who are training your bodies for a marathon. As we get closer to the OKC Marathon and all these other things, there are so many of you in the church who are running and getting ready for that. You know how I feel about running or exercise in general. We read in the book of Proverbs, only the wicked run when no one is chasing them, right? That's in the Bible. And so as much as I try to tell you, I cannot convince any of you of that. But what I love about you guys who are running, you have your eyes on the prize. You have a goal. You have a purpose. You're like, I'm running this race. I'm getting my body ready for it. And some weeks you'll come in and be like, oh, my knees are blowing up. They're hurting so bad. Like, I don't know. And I'm like, oh, so you're quitting? No, no, no. I'm going to go out tomorrow and I'm going to run with my pain in my knees because I have a goal. I have a purpose. My eye is on the prize. And the next week, someone comes to my back is killing me. Sometimes they come in. I'm like, when I see you running, you look like you are being tortured. Like you look, no one ever looks happy when they're running. Like, what's the deal? But they're like, I've got my eyes on the prize. I have a purpose. I have a mission. And really, I think the reason people like the Apostle Paul in the scriptures equates our walk with Jesus, our faith journey, the reason they use the metaphor of a race so often is because I think there is something for us to learn there, that we really are running a race. There is a purpose, there is a mission, there is difficulty along the way, but to be resilient and to walk that race or run that race with resolve You have to be resolute. You have to be faith-filled. You have to continually reinforce that resolve. Are you with me? And we're going to learn from Jesus how that looks today, but that's what it will require. The verse that really has kind of sat with me for a few weeks that I wanted to talk about for Palm Sunday comes from Luke chapter 9, verse 51. It says, When the day drew near... For him to be taken up, this is talking about Jesus, as the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face toward Jerusalem. As the time came closer and closer for his crucifixion, as the time came closer and closer for the end of his ministry physically here on earth, he set his face toward Jerusalem. On Palm Sunday, the church remembers that that Jesus entered Jerusalem. You might be familiar with this idea of the triumphal entry. People are waving palm branches. They are celebrating. They are singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We remember that on Palm Sunday. But you have to remember that even as Jesus has set his face towards Jerusalem, this has been the goal, this has been the purpose of his ministry for so long. When he enters Jerusalem, Jesus knows that he is just about five days away from being executed between two thieves on a cross. Jesus knows the very crowds that are cheering Hosanna on that day would in just a few days turn their backs on him. In fact, they would cheer, crucify him, crucify him. Jesus knew the horrors that awaited him on the cross. Jesus knew the painful tribulations that he would go through. Jesus knew the agony that faced him. He had set his face toward Jerusalem long ago. And nothing was going to stop him. We see this in John chapter 12, verse 27. Throughout the Gospel of John, John writes about this moment as Jesus' hour. This is his hour, the hour for which he came. Look what we read in verse 27. Jesus says, now my soul is troubled. The Greek word there, it, it, it literally means like a storm that is raging on the sea. Jesus is saying, my heart is like a storm tossed sea. My heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? Save me from the cross? Save me from what is to come? Save me from the pain and the torment that I will go through? Jesus says, no, I have come. This is my purpose. For this purpose, I've come. This is the hour that I've come for. He has set his sights on his purpose. He has set his sights on his mission. He has set his face toward Jerusalem. And the purpose of God, the purpose of his father to fulfill it, 
would not be an easy task. And Jesus seems to be, throughout the Gospels, the only one that really grasps this. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. Let me warn you today. Usually at our church, like I'm kind of in one passage, and we just kind of sit there for a little bit. Today's going to be exciting, right? We're, we're, there's a lot of passages that we're looking at today. So those of you who are like reading from your Bible, smoke is going to be coming off of your fingers as you flip through to all these. But Luke chapter 18, verse 31. Look what it says. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem. I've set my face towards Jerusalem. And everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him. They will insult him. They will spit on him. They will flog him. And they will kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. And I love this, this, this fact that Luke records there. The disciples did not understand any of this. Because for them, they, they have no concept. They have no room to understand a Messiah who would be tortured. They've been waiting for the Messiah. They've been waiting for their Savior to come. And their Savior was going to be, in their minds, a military ruler. Somebody who would come and help to overthrow their Roman oppressors. So they're looking for a victorious military ruler to come. They have no space to think about a, a, a one who would come and be tortured and be killed and be tormented and mocked and painfully die. They have no room for that. They don't understand that. So what we see as we look to Jesus and as we look throughout his ministry, we're going to kind of go in the life of Jesus, in the ministry of Jesus. He sets his face towards Jerusalem. He has put his eyes on his purpose and the mission of his father. But to live for the purpose of God in your life does not exempt you from problems or pain. In fact, we're going to see that for Jesus there was opposition to him fulfilling the purpose of the Father throughout his life. And as we see that opposition, we see how Jesus would continually reinforce his resolve to do the will of his Father. I came across an interesting study at the end of last year done by a large research firm called Barna. Uh, many of you might be familiar with Barna. They did a huge study across the United States of, of people of faith, Christians in the United States. And they had different categories of believers. And the one that most pastors like me were interested in was this category that was resilient disciples, right? These are people who their faith has been tested. They stay true to their faith. They're plugged into their local church. They are reading God's word. They are praying. They are resilient disciples. No matter what has come their way, they have continued to follow God faithfully, and the number of people in the U.S. that fell into that category of resilient disciples was 9%. 9% of people fell into that category of resilient disciples. And my goal would be that, that our whole church would be filled with resilient disciples of Jesus. And as the followers of Jesus, even as we look at Jesus, who has set his face towards Jerusalem and faced so much opposition along the way, I think we learn what it means for us to be resilient in our faith and resilient as the followers of Jesus. Amen? I know that, that you would pray that in your own life. So let's see what Jesus went through, the opposition that Jesus faces. Throughout his life, there are powers, there are people who are seeking to keep him from his hour. The hour that he would go to the cross, the hour that he would fulfill the will of the Father, the hour that he would rescue us and save us. And it actually begins at his birth. It begins at his birth with opposition from authorities. Now, I know Jesus has faced opposition from authorities all throughout the Gospels, so if you're trying to like grade me on this, I'm not covering every example of when Jesus faced opposition from authorities, all right? So don't like check mark me, but, but what I'm trying to say is you'll see that there were people who tried to stop him from accomplishing his purpose throughout his whole life. And at his birth, it actually begins with Herod. If you remember Herod, the puppet king that was in that region, the Magi, they come from the east and they tell Herod, hey, we're familiar with the prophecies. We've seen this star. We followed it all the way to this region. And we know that the king of the Jews has been born around here, which is a weird thing to say to a guy who considers himself to be the king of the Jews, right? So Herod doesn't take this very well. 
Herod doesn't take this very well, and he commands that every boy under the age of two in that region be murdered because his goal is to take out this newborn king. And look what happens. As the Magi come, they visit Joseph, Mary, Jesus, right after they leave in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So Joseph, he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so, this is so important, check this out. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. It's so interesting that, that, that this whole story could have ended right there. Herod tries to take out Jesus at his birth when he's less than two years old. And while Herod is trying to stamp out the prophecies that the Magi come and tell him, the prophecies about the coming Messiah, while Herod looks to stamp out those prophecies, he actually works to fulfill another prophecy. There's a prophecy that the Messiah is going to come out of Egypt. They have no clue. They have no idea. They have no plans to go to Egypt until Herod commands the babies be killed. The angel tells Joseph, go to Egypt. And then Jesus fulfills even another prophecy. You, you can't win a fight against God. Doesn't matter if you're Herod. Doesn't matter if you think you're big and bad. Doesn't matter how powerful you think you are. In every circumstance, in every situation, in every painful trial, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of what might seem to be unplanned and out of control, God is sovereign. Amen. His purposes will come to pass, and Jesus has come into this world to fulfill a purpose. He has set his face toward Jerusalem, and it doesn't matter what powers in the world would try to stop him. God's plan will come to pass. And in your life, you may feel like God has given you a purpose. And you may believe that God has given you a, a mission. And you feel like every time you turn around, something is trying to stop the work of God in and through your life. And it might be authorities in your life. It, it might be a boss at work. It, it might be someone who's among your peers. It might be someone in the government. It could be someone in some place of authority in your life. It could be your parents. For some of you, I know this, that you are trying to faithfully follow God. And, and, and it might go against human convention, but for you, the reality is your own parents are kind of like, why, why, what's, what's your deal? Like, why are you into all this faith stuff? Why are you into all this church stuff? Where did all this come from? Why are you like, you know, you know, this isn't, this isn't us. Our family's not like this. And authorities may be trying to oppose the work of God in your life. And you need to know this, that no matter what, no matter what powers of this world might try to thwart the work of God in and through you, God is sovereign. He is powerful, and he is in control. So we see this opposition from Herod, but we also see that Jesus faces opposition spiritually. He faces opposition from Satan. If you remember when Jesus began his ministry, he is baptized, and in a very public way, he is commissioned. Do you remember? The, the dove descends upon Jesus in the form of the Holy Spirit. He's filled with the Spirit. A voice thunders from heaven, behold my son whom I loved and whom I am well pleased. Jesus is commissioned there. And it says the Holy Spirit leads him out into the wilderness where he is tempted by the devil. And in that moment, I want you to look at one of the temptations that Jesus faces. Luke chapter 4, verses 5 to 8. It says the devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. I don't know how this works. I think Jesus is almost seeing like a movie. Like, I don't know how it works. But somehow Jesus sees all the kingdoms of the world in that moment. And the devil says to him, I will give you all authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, with this temptation, Satan makes what is kind of a true and a false statement at the same time, kind of how 
the devil operates, right? The Bible says that he is a deceiver. When Adam surrendered the authority that God had given him in the garden, remember, Adam and Eve are given all dominion over all the earth and over all things. And in sin, they surrender that authority as they choose to follow the word of Satan rather than the word of God. When they surrender that authority, this world comes under the curse of sin. So we live in a fallen, broken world. And so in some ways, Satan throughout the scripture is even called the ruler of this world. But the place where it's false, and I know, give me a second, we're going to dive deep and then we'll come back up to the surface, right? So this is one of those, this is the portion of it where throughout the week, you'll send me emails like, hey, like, can you expand on this a little bit? Like, let's talk, let's, let's meet over coffee and talk about this. But what happens is that any dominion that the devil has, any authority he has is within the sovereign constraints of God's will. Are you with me? Like, he is not in authority over God. God still rules over everything. God still appoints kings and leaders, rules over the nations. God is in charge. But there is some limited authority that Satan has in this world. All of that will come to an end one day. Right? That's what's interesting about this. What Satan is promising Jesus, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. One day, Jesus will have all the kingdoms of this world. Satan will be absolutely defeated forever. He will have no authority over this world. Jesus will establish his kingdom, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He will rule forever. The scripture says the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and Christ. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. No doubt Jesus will have all the kingdoms of this world. But what Satan is willing to do in this temptation, he's saying, Jesus, why don't I give you the kingdoms of this world and you avoid the cross altogether? Why do you want to go to Jerusalem and be mocked and beaten and killed and tortured between thieves? Like, why do you want to do that? I'll give you the crown without a cross. That's the temptation. But here's the thing for Jesus. Jesus did not come to win the kingdoms of this world. Jesus came to save you and me. And Satan is happy to give him the kingdoms of the world as long as he can hold on to you and me. And so Jesus says, I must go to the cross because the cross is the way that I'm going to win my children back to the Father. We read this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14. This is God. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and he has brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Jesus doesn't want a kingdom without you. Jesus doesn't want a kingdom without me. He has brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. That's the temptation. That's the temptation. And in your life too, as you seek to fulfill the purpose of God, as you seek to fulfill the mission of God, don't miss that Satan might be willing to give you the kingdoms of this world as long as he can keep your children. And Satan might be willing to give you the kingdoms of this world as long as everybody who works with you still belongs to him. And they don't hear the message of the gospel from you. You don't share your faith with them. Satan might be willing. Sometimes we think like the the stuff in this world is the way that Satan is messing with us. Satan might be willing to give you all that as long as he can keep the people that are around you, the people who listen to you and the people who are in your life. So know that there is opposition coming from the enemy and your purpose, your mission is greater than what you can achieve or attain in this world. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that. He would not accept a kingdom without a cross because he did not want a kingdom without you and without me. So he set his face towards Jerusalem and nothing would stop him. Jesus faced opposition from people all around him. If you remember the first time he goes back to his hometown to minister there, and he preaches in his hometown, you think, this is Jesus, famous rabbi, doing miracles, preaching with great authority. You think it would go well, but it did not go very well. (laughs) Last Saturday, uh, Saturday night, 
uh, was my nephew's engagement party. So he proposed to his fiance like during the day in the rain in Dallas. And then that night, uh, we had a big party for him, which kind of included a prayer meeting, which is how my family does parties, right? Parties, prayer meetings, all the same thing. And so <laughs> we, I was preaching at his engagement dinner uh, last Saturday night. And I'm preaching, and you guys hear me preach every week, but it's different with you. Because here, as I'm preaching, I look over, and like, there's my sister, and there's my brother, and here's like all my cousins who I've known since I was a kid. And I was like, these people can't take me seriously. Like, there's, they've, they've like changed my diapers. Like, they just know everything about me, right? There's no way. I got super nervous. I was like, I can't preach to them. No one can take me seriously. They know every sin I have ever committed in my entire life. So that's what Jesus is doing. He's in his hometown, and he's preaching to his hometown. He opens the book of the prophet Isaiah and he preaches, oh, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the captives, to free those who are enslaved, to, to, to bring uh, sight to those who are blind. I mean, he goes through the book of Isaiah and it says the crowd is actually really excited. And then Jesus just kind of messes it up, right? Like it's just, they're, they're in and they're with him. And then he's like, stop, don't be excited. And he's like, here's what you don't know. You think that the stuff I'm talking about is just for you. This is what we've sort of been talking about over the past few weeks in our series about loving your neighbor. See, this group thought that the gospel of Jesus, the kingdom of God, was a very ethnocentric gospel and a very ethnocentric kingdom. They thought, hey, this is just for us, good news just for our people and people who are just like us. And when Jesus starts to tell them, hey, this is a message for the Gentiles. This is a message for all people. I have come to save everybody and bring everybody into my kingdom. When Jesus starts to tell this crowd, this is even a message for Romans. I have come to reconcile them to God and reconcile them to you. I have come to save all people. The crowd is not feeling that. They're like, what are you talking about, Jesus? We thought you're here to kill Romans. You mean you're coming to die for them, to save them? And look what happens. In uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 28, all the people in the synagogue were furious. Like I said, Jesus' first message in his hometown did not go well. Furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. Right? I have a much easier crowd here than Jesus did there in the synagogue. They're going to throw him off a cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. I don't even know how Jesus did this. Right? You've got a crowd of people about to kill you and throw you off a cliff. And he does some kind of like Jedi mind trick. This is not the rabbi you are looking for. And he just <laughs> walks right through them and he leaves. Right? Like, I don't know how this works. Because it was not yet his hour. It was not yet his hour. They're ready to take him out. They're ready for it to be done. But Jesus has come to go to the cross. Jesus has come to set his face towards Jerusalem. My friend, whatever opposition you face, whatever causes you to be filled with fear or worry or anxiety, whatever threatens to zap your courage in the gospel from you, know this. The way God works, the way God protects, the way that God will be with you until it is your hour, it is miraculous, it is mind-blowing, but he is good, and he is powerful, and he is able. And I cannot always explain the ways he will come through for you as you look towards your purpose and as you fix your eyes with resilience on what God has called you to do, but he will come through for you. Now, another way that Jesus is faced with opposition from, from people actually comes, we see, in John chapter 6. In John 6, Jesus feeds thousands of people with some fish and some loaves of bread. And this is a good thing. But look what we read, John 6, verse 14. After, people, after the people saw the signs that Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him their king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. See, this happens around the time of Passover. And for these people, Passover was a, a time of nationalistic fervor. 
right? So they are waiting for the Messiah. They are foaming at the mouth to get the Romans out of there. They are remembering the way that Moses brought them out of Egypt. So now here comes Jesus. And this Messiah, kind of like Moses, gets manna to fall from heaven and quelled. This Messiah is able to come and turn a few loaves of bread and some fish into a meal that feeds thousands of people. So they look to him at this time where they are waiting for the Romans to be overthrown. And they are just like, he's, he's the one. Like, he's who we have been waiting for. He fulfills all the prophecies. He teaches with such authority. This is who we've been waiting for. And they want to come by force and make him their king. Which, as I told you, that's what's going to happen eventually anyway. But again, Jesus cannot be their king without the cross. He has to go to the cross because he's not looking to establish an earthly kingdom. He is looking to bring all of us in to the family of God. That's what he has come to do. So his eyes are set on Jerusalem. And I believe this is a true temptation for Jesus. They're about to make him the king. So he withdraws and he goes by himself to the mountains to be with his father. Because in his father's presence, as he runs to the father over and over again, in his father's presence is where he finds the, the ability to find that resolution and that resilience that he needs in order to face the cross. It is where he reinforces his resolve to head to Jerusalem and give his life for us. So the opposition from people, it might be that people lift you up, it might be that people cast you down, but people will look to keep you from doing what God has called you to do. Can you face those temptations that come your way in intimate fellowship with your Father as you are refreshed, as he reinforces your resolve to look to the cross and do what you've been called to do? Finally, we see that Jesus faces even opposition from within. As he gets closer and closer and closer to his hour, that moment for which he has come. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, we read this. That when Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, he said to them, sit here while I go over there and I pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. There's that word again, that he's, he's troubled like a raging sea within his heart. He is sorrowful and he's troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. You know, and as we approach Holy Week and the celebrations and all that is good, I don't want you to forget that for Jesus, he was going to face an agonizing circumstance for you and for me. That he was going to face torture and death and punishment to rescue us. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. So he says to his disciples, stay here and keep watch with me. And going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Three different times. Three different times Jesus prays this prayer. And again, it is in the presence of his Father. It is in this intimate fellowship. It is in these moments of solitary prayer where Jesus continually reinforces his resolve to accomplish the purpose for which his Father has sent him. It is in that place. How is it that, that we, we read about the martyrs, we read about those who have given their lives, even some of the disciples, that when they came to the time of their death, they did it with such courage. Right? Even Socrates, how does Socrates drink the cup of hemlock with such courage? But here Jesus is facing the cup that he needs to drink, and it seems like he's so filled with pain and anguish and sorrow. And we have to remember they're drinking two different cups those martyrs and the disciples, they're drinking the cup of man's wrath, but Jesus is drinking the cup of God's wrath in a way. Because Jesus is drinking the cup 
where he is about to take on the punishment that all of us deserve. The punishment for all of our sins, the punishment for all that we have done. Jesus is about to take that upon himself, so his anguish is different. No one has ever felt the weight that Jesus is experiencing there. And he goes to his father again and again, and that's where he reinforces his resolve to face what God the Father has called him to face. And I love how that passage ends. He basically, the disciples keep falling asleep. They can't even stay awake long enough to pray. Jesus is over here agonizing. And at the end of that section, Jesus is basically like, all right, boys, come on, let's go. I mean, he is just, he is steadfast, filled with courage and faith and ready. Come on, boys, let's go. Our betrayer comes. That's what he says. He's like, look, they're coming. They're coming to get me. Matthew chapter 26, verse 52. As they come, as the soldiers come, as Judas comes, Peter leaps out with his knife, with his sword, and he cuts off the ear of Malchus, right? Because Peter has terrible aim, apparently, because I, even I know that's not how you use a sword, right? And so he cuts off this guy's ear. And look what Jesus says in verse 52 of Matthew 26. Put your sword back in its place, Peter. Stop. You don't even know how to use that thing, Peter. Just put it away. <laughs> Just go catch fish. All right, put that away. Jesus said to him, all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Hey, Peter, you better be careful what kind of kingdom you want to live in. Right? I, I'm not coming to start a kingdom that is won by the sword. All who live by the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father? This is what I want you to see. Do you not think I can call on my father? He will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. In, in Roman military language, he's talking about 72,000 angels. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Even at the end when his friends and his disciples are trying to rescue him from the cross, Jesus is like, put your sword back. Like, this is not, this is not them winning over me. This is me willingly giving myself to do what the Father has sent me to do. I'm not getting defeated. If I wanted to, I could call 72,000 angels right now to take all these guys out. I actually like, I know we don't even have time for this, but I love the way John tells this particular moment, the way he writes about it. Look at John chapter 18, verse 3 to 6. It's just so cool. So the way John writes what happens here, it's the same instance, it's the same uh, episode that's happening. Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, look what he does. It's not like Jesus is hiding behind all the disciples. He's not trying to get away. He's not hiding. Jesus just went right out and asked them. He walks right up to them, knowing why they're there, and he says, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth? They replied, like, uh, we think it's you. Jesus of Nazareth? They replied. And check this out. This is why I love John. Jesus says, I am he. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. And when Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Right? So the way John tells the story, is Jesus doesn't even need 72,000 angels. He just needs to say his name. He says his name and they all just fall down. Right? Like they all pass out. I don't know. They're all terrified. I don't know what happens. And then, I love it. Jesus is such a boss. Right after that, Jesus asks again. Now, who is it you're looking for <laughs> right after he says this, after they all pass out? Tell me, who is it you are looking for? Again, this is not them overcoming Jesus. This is Jesus allowing himself to be arrested, to be taken, because he knows the purpose for which he has come. It is for you. It is for me. The opposition continues even on the cross. You remember the thief looking over to Jesus and saying, hey, you've saved so many others. Why don't you save yourself? Why don't you come down off that cross? Like there's this temptation, this opposition, even at the end. And Jesus, with resolute faith and courage, can say, I did not come to save myself. He came to save you. He came to save me. 
And so he would say, I can't save them without this cross. I can't save them unless I die for them in their place so they can have eternal life through me. To the end, he's resolute. To the end, he will not give up. He wouldn't take a shortcut. He wouldn't do it any other way. He knew he had come to go to the cross, and we remember that throughout this week. And the question is, why? Why would he do that? The first one is this. He does it out of love for the Father. He does it out of love for the Father. I don't even know that the first reason was necessarily you and me. He does it out of love for the Father. John chapter 14, verse 30. As Jesus is saying farewell to his disciples, I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me to do. Jesus says, this is not some strategy of Satan that is winning out. He has no claim on me. But I go to the cross because I love the Father and I will fulfill his will and his purpose for my life. He does it out of love for the Father. The second reason why Jesus does this, why he sets his face towards Jerusalem to die and nothing can stop him is because he loves you. He loves you. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. The apostle Paul writes these words, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I love the way the Apostle Paul writes that because he doesn't write something that is vague or applies to everyone. He didn't say, oh, he loved the world. He loved everybody. He loved all people. For Paul, it is personal. He loved me. And you can make it that personal. Jesus went through all this. Nothing could sway him. Nothing could move him. Nothing could stop him. He went to the cross because he loves you. As if you were the only one to love. He loves you. And we read in the scripture that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I need you to understand Jesus doesn't love some future version of you. Jesus doesn't love some version of me that's like, well, now Jason's finally got his act together. He's getting things right. He's figuring things out. So now I love him. Jesus loved me at my worst. Jesus loves you knowing everything about you. It is so personal. The scripture says that your name is written on his hand. Everything you've ever done, every sin you've ever committed, every mistake you've ever made, he knows every thought that you have ever had, and he loves you. He could not love you any more. He could not love you any less. You could not do anything to make him love you any more or love you any less. He loves you, and he set his face towards Jerusalem, and nothing could stop him. Nothing could stop him until he did what he was called to do so that he could win you into the kingdom of light. Jesus loves you. So what do we do with that? How do we respond to that? First, I ask that you simply receive the gift of his love. Receive the gift of his love. Receive the gift of his grace. Receive the gift of his forgiveness. Receive the gift of salvation. Receive the gift of God singing over you with songs of joy and cheer as the Father welcomes you into his family, adopts you as his sons and daughters. Receive the gift of Christ's love for you. And the second thing is resolve to do the Father's will in your life. That's how we respond to what Jesus has done on the cross Resolve to do the will of the Father in your life. Resolve to honor him. Resolve to give all your life to him. Refuse, refuse some kind of lukewarm Christianity. Refuse some kind of half-hearted 
following Jesus. Refuse only giving part of your life to him. Give him your whole life. Surrender your whole will, body, mind, soul to him. That's how you respond to what Jesus has done for you. Don't make excuses for half-hearted following. Oh, you know, it's just my personality. I don't really get very excited about stuff. Don't make an excuse. Give your whole life to doing the will of God. We read in Jeremiah, you will find him when you seek him, if you seek him with what? Your whole heart. May the reminder of what Jesus has done for us be what leads us to resolve to do the will of the Father with everything that we have. Set your face toward the presence of God. Set your face towards prayer. Not just a place where you bring your needs before God, but a place where you get to know God. Where you live in intimacy with God, where you know him, where you run to him so that you can reinforce your resolve to live for him and accomplish the purpose that he has called you to. Set your heart towards prayer. Set your heart towards mission. God, what are you calling me to do? Who are you calling me to talk to? Who are you calling me to bring into your family? Set your heart towards service. Serve your community. Serve those who are in need. Help those who need a little bit of help. Carry the burdens of someone that you don't know so that they too may experience the love of Jesus that has transformed you. Set your face towards God's purpose for you. And I hope that in this you have seen, no matter who you are, no matter what you have gone through, no matter what life's circumstances may have done to you or caused you to think about yourself, God has a purpose for your life. God has a purpose for your life. And opposition might come at you from a hundred different ways, but if you are still breathing, God is not done with you. It is not yet your hour. So keep your face fixed on him and follow him that you might fulfill the purpose for which he has called you. Jesus did this. Jesus did this so that we could do it too. He went to the cross. He gave his life and all who would trust in him and his finished work on the cross, you have been given new life. You are made new. You are the sons and daughters of God. But not only that, he gives you his spirit. And the Holy Spirit in you empowers you with that resolve and with that resilience. The Holy Spirit in you is what is going to keep you moving towards the purpose of God on the days where it's hard and on the days where it feels impossible. You have the power. The same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives in you. Receive the gift of his love. Resolve to do the will of the Father. And I pray that God would use you and your resilient faith to change your world. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for...